morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, TPO meeting for July 18th, 2019. I call the meeting to order. Need a motion for approval of the agenda. Okay, second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Let's get a little more enthusiasm here. Right. <laughs> okay, we'll now move to the executive director's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, included in your agenda, under agenda item number three, is on a monthly um, report which outlines some of the activities we've completed on your behalf over the past month. Um, just a few items I'd like to bring to the board's attention, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first off, uh, the Elizabeth River Crossing Task Force, which was formed by this TPO board, um, held a meeting on June the 26th, which was hosted in Portsmouth. Um, we were very pleased with that meeting, and I, I just want to go on record as thanking uh, Commissioner Bridge uh, for his attendance and participation at that meeting, uh, Secretary Shannon Valentine, um, Deputy Secretary of Transportation Lawson, um, and I believe, uh, Commissioner, you brought at least three to four VDOT staff people with you as well, and I, I must say, we, we had a two to two and a half hour discussion questions and answers and really got a great briefing I thought uh, from uh, the commissioner's team on the ERC contract. It was the opportunity for our ERC task force members to ask questions, to um, uh, uh, try to understand what the contract had to say and what it meant to our community. And I think coming out of that meeting, the real opportunity is that the secretary's office is going to be looking at this ERC agreement um, between now and next June uh, to perhaps look at some opportunities or recommendations in how we move forward. The task force is really excited to work in a collaborative track with the Secretary's Office on that initiative. So uh, we'll continue to work, uh, report back on that, Mr. Chairman, that um, um, I, I know Mr. Shepard was in attendance as a member of the task force. I just thought it was a very, very productive meeting, a lot of uh, great information shared. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll conclude with my remarks with that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to the workshop agenda item. Probably the Commonwealth of the State Commonwealth Transportation Board. Uh, let's see. Do we have anybody here from the Commonwealth? I don't believe so. Okay. So let's go to BI Chris Hall. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a real quick update. Uh, segment three, uh, looking at our major projects uh, up on the peninsula. Uh, work is progressing very well up there. All the, uh, the bridge work on Queens Creek is underway. That's a critical path element to that project, uh, as well as the rest of the area has opened up. And you, obviously, if you've driven up there, seen a lot of activity. Uh, segment two has been open to the public since May. Uh, we do have some elements we're continuing to work with the contractor on. So as you look on your sheet, it says late. Basically, we haven't closed that project out yet. But uh, again, uh, as noted, that project has been open to the public uh, and, and in use since, since May. So we, we anticipate actually getting that project uh, closed out uh, within the next uh, month or so. Um, moving down onto the south side, 264-64 interchange work. Uh, we're uh, finishing up the phase one there, still on track for October. Uh, the main components that are, are underway right now is Bridge 602. That's the flyover that brings you into the main line on 264 there, so you notice that work uh, underway right now. Uh, on phase two, further down with the Witch Duck connection, major priority there is working the uh, approach work of the actual flyover, which takes you over to Cleveland Avenue. So uh, again, that those both those segment one and two are on track, and um, that work is progressing well. Also, the high-rise bridge, uh, we did have the contractor in a full shutdown for most of the month of June due to some uh, permitting issues that we had to get corrected. Uh, that uh, the contractor is back to work on the bridge. <coughs> Um, so uh, we're continuing to work with them on the, on the permitting actions. We'll see what the impacts to the schedule are on that project probably within the next month or two as they resubmit their schedules. But uh, uh, good that we've got them back to work and you can see them working on the bridge. Uh, most of the pier work, uh, caps, uh, pier caps, pile caps, uh, a lot of that concrete work is underway. Last thing I'll note is uh, the Bowers Hill study. We did complete the sensitivity analysis on that. That'll be back in the working group's hands of the TTAC here probably uh, 
certainly by late this week, and we should get um, that analysis back on tap for decision to the board uh, within the next, uh, I think we're on track for uh, the next TPO board to have that presented. Depending on your questions, that concludes my update. Thank you, thank you Chris. Uh, just for feedback to VDOT uh, and to board members, I don't know the feedback you're getting from citizens on this side of the roads, but uh, on the, uh, the other side, uh, when I talk about uh, people going from, from uh, Hampton or from York County, anywhere heading towards Richmond to uh, Williamsburg, I go, how was the trip? And I, I get two things, smile and go, thank God. You know, <laughs> we put it in there. And, uh, and, uh, and then there's a third one that comes in, when are you going to extend it all the way to Richmond? <laughs> but the feedback is great. The beautiful roads are just doing tremendous. That's great work. Thank you. Okay, uh, well, DR, uh, DRPT, uh, Jennifer Group. Good morning. Just a brief update this morning. Uh, the Commonwealth Transportation Board approved our six year program last month. We're working with WADA and HRT and Suffolk Transit on the projects that were identified for funding. A couple of, of things to note, we had a significant investment in electric transit vehicles, of which six are going to HRT. We're excited about that pilot program and looking forward to working with HRT and other agencies over the next couple of years to expand the use of some VW mitigation trust funds that have enabled us to um, really accelerate that work. Uh, the other item I wanted to mention is our inner city bus program, Virginia Breeze, uh, which currently serves uh, travelers between Blacksburg and DC. We just completed an expansion study, and while we don't have a route slated to come to Hampton Roads, we did receive um, some feedback as part of our public process that there was a desire to have uh, east-west connections between the Hampton Roads region and the southwest part of the state. While our proposed route terminates in Richmond, we are trying to coordinate that with rail and commercial bus service. Uh, to make sure that we provide those vital connections primarily to Old Dominion University. We received some feedback from them through our study process. So uh, we're looking forward to continuing to work with them and, and the region to expand our inner city bus program. That concludes my report. Thank you very much. Uh, Dean Port Authority, Mark Nelson. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to meet here this morning. Kathy Vick uh, was inadvertently delayed in another meeting and is unable to attend, so I'm attending on her behalf today. And I would like to yield our time to Larry Ewan with the uh, HRTPO uh, Freight Technical Advisory Committee. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, FTAC uh, is proud to be a active standing committee of the HRTPO and to provide you with a voice for regional planning purposes for freight. Just a little summary, since December of 2018, when we really got geared up to be able to respond to all of the needs that HRTPO had for us. We responded um, for the project prioritization tool. We recommended actions on 70 projects. Uh, we contributed to transportation systems for the 2045 long range planning and has received briefings from the economic development sites, inventory and regional connectors. We look forward to continuing the active support of HRTPO and our next meeting is scheduled for September 25th of this year. That concludes my report. Thanks, sir. Um, we have Wyatt, Zach Trogan. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just two quick things. We uh, recently have taken um, delivery of six, six replacement buses that are going to replace some aging buses in our fleet. Thank you to um, the RPT and the TPO for allowing that to happen. It's about a year from award back last summer to uh, delivery this summer. And we're also working on a project to extend the, the life of some of the buses that are used by the Pony Williamsburg Foundation through a partnership with WADA by replacing the compressed natural gas fuel tanks that they have. So we're proud of that project because it makes environmentally friendly by not needing to use the raw materials right now to replace those buses and being able to extend them. And um, I'd also just like to say, I, uh, several weeks ago, there was an editorial, I think, came out one of the papers down here. I believe it was um, Mayor Tuck and Mayor Rowe had, had written about the Transform Transit. And I was going to say it was, it was nice to see that that thing, all the support that that issued, that effort's getting, and, and we a lot of certainly watching that and, and participating when we can. And look forward to it being a, being a success. And, and, and being a part of it. Thank you. Okay. HRT, Bill Harrell. 
Yeah, good morning, and uh, I just want to echo uh, Mr. Trocker's uh, uh, comments uh, relative to the partnership with the Department of Rail and Public Transportation. There have been so many projects that they've been supportive of, uh, including the uh, strategic planning uh, effort that uh, Mr. Trocker mentioned, and clearly uh, working with Suffolk and Williamsburg is part of that particular effort. And, Mr. Crum, I know, is assisting uh, in that coordination. I'll just say uh, we're proceeding very well uh, with the project. Uh, we've had significant public involvement. Uh, we've had uh, 8,000 views on our project website, transformtransit.com. If you haven't been there, please check it out. Uh, we've had small group workshops uh, with over 40 stakeholder organizations. Uh, we've got input from the regional advisory panel, and we certainly want to thank uh, Mayor Tuck and Mayor Rowe for meeting that. And in fact, their last meeting, we also had uh, Mayor Dyer and Mayor West. So uh, we're real pleased. So it's going to take all of us to look at the collective way to improve public uh, transportation. So uh, I want to thank you for the support of uh, Mr. Crum in this effort. ways to address it uh, as well. So we intend to update uh, this group, I believe, in the fall, and we'll coordinate that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, CTAC, uh, Jammer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at our June meeting, we got to play with the branding and marketing of the region, and it was really fun. Uh, we, it, there was a lot of enthusiasm. Everybody who attended the meeting participated. And I think one of the really important things about it was that as we talked about the region, we started thinking about it more as a region. And we started looking at the assets that a lot of people just take for granted. Um, what tied it to transportation for a lot of us was the fact that transportation is absolutely key to attracting people to the region. So um, as we look at, at marketing ourselves better, uh, we really do need to look at how we get around the region as a region, better than that includes. <laughs> um, and the other thing I just wanted to bring up because we have these, uh, we have new service now in Norfolk for Amet or Amtrak, sorry. And one of the things that came up uh, in a conversation I was having was the difficulty of getting information about the Norfolk stops now uh, through Amtrak. Uh, their website is not particularly easy to maneuver. And the other thing is that they were told, uh, the person I was talking to had been told that the train stopped in Richmond and she couldn't get to Norfolk. And since she had been um, diverted into DC because a uh, train broke down, she was really puzzled because they were, they were landing at night in Richmond and thought that they might have to actually take a cab to get to this part of the world. And fortunately, the, uh, the people on the train knew where they were going, so they took care of them. But it, it, it really it, it does us no good to have this new service if people are not aware of it. And that starts at Amtrak. That's not our, you know, our region's problem, except that we're the, on the receiving end of the misinformation. So I think that we need to. Thank you. Military liaison update, Colonel Better. It's good to get back with you all. I've uh, made the last uh, few, few years. I've been pretty busy at Joint Base uh, Langley Eustis, as you can uh, imagine, with stuff going on in the Middle East. Uh, fairly historic uh, deployment of F-22 aircraft uh, recently. But what I wanted to mention was uh, big changes to military medicine uh, over the upcoming years with our transition to the Defense Health Agency it has the potential uh, for us putting a lot of our soldiers, dependents, and retirees uh, on the road heading down to the south side for care. So I do appreciate some of the efforts that we took uh, earlier this year with expanding the, the bridge tunnel. I'm, uh, I'm afraid we're going to get a lot of use out of that uh, here with these changes in, in military medicine. We did it just for you. Thanks. <laughs> I live in Virginia Beach working wagon, so I, I'm really good. We love you in Virginia Beach. Can't afford it. Good morning, Mr. Chair. I can't top that, so okay. <laughs> okay. Commander Francisco. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Good morning. Um, around the country, this past year, every Coast Guard sector has worked to uh, develop a marine transportation, marine transportation system recovery plan, um, and Hampton Roads is no exception. So we've been working in lockstep with our partners with the Army Corps of Engineers, with NOAA, with various Navy commands, 
uh, on the water side and uh, with the Virginia Department of Emergency Management and uh, the Virginia National Guard on the land side to um, increase our ability to reconstitute the, the Fort Hampton roads after a uh, hurricane or other uh, disrupting event. Um, hurricane season, as we all know, did begin June 1st. Uh, we've already had one hurricane landfall in Louisiana. Uh, so we're very mindful of the disruptions that can occur and we're doing everything we can to uh, affect a speedy recovery after the disrupting event. Thank you, Mr. I know you guys hear this a lot, but I just want to thank you guys for the service. Okay, so now we'll hear from airport representatives. We'll start off with uh, Robert Bowen. Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, pleased to report that in uh, June 2019, we had the highest cash count of any previous June in our 81 year history, and it was the second highest passenger count of any month uh, in our history. Uh, for the fiscal year ending uh, June 30, the uh, Norfolk Airport had a total of 3,868,103 passengers, which is a 10.94% uh, increase over fiscal year 2018. Also in June, uh, the Norfolk Airport Authority has a successful issuance of $4,435,000 in non-AMT general airport revenue bonds with a premium of over $12 million for a nine level 3200 space uh, parking garage. The bonds have a 5% coupon and an all in true interest cost of 3.16%. Uh, this parking garage will primarily replace 2,200 long term surface lot spaces in an area that is critically needed for aircraft apron. A remote 600 uh, space employee parking lot that requires 24-hour shuttle bus service and 330 long-term spaces in another garage that were converted for rental car return. Uh, we expect construction to begin uh, in September. Next when is it, when is it supposed to end? Uh, it will take about 18 months. 18 months of pay. Very good. Excellent. So you guys are uh, really uh, hot and down. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a good role right now. Making the best of it. Okay, for the Peninsula Report, we have uh, Mike Giardino. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, everybody. Uh, we're also doing well. Uh, back from the national meeting that Norfolk was at, too, airlines are paying attention again. That's good news. And uh, I call us a high-demand, low-density asset from my military days. Um, we, we need more traffic. Or the airplanes are booked. Uh, oversold most of the time, and uh, so the demand signal is absolutely there. So, talking about regionalism, uh, we have two fabulous facilities, and we need to do, we use both of them. Uh, doing great. Uh, zero discrepancies on our FAA investigation. The place is a fabulous facility. It is well run, and uh, we only had one discrepancy last year, and that was a faded decal. So two years in a row doing really, really well. And we're celebrating 70 years of commercial air service this year. Uh, and we're going to, that, that'll culminate in an event, a 5K on the runway, September 14th. So get out your running shoes and sign up at uh, flyphf.com. Uh, lastly, I have a lot of uh, new executive staff. So I know my governmental counterparts um, be patient with us as they learn the ground and learn your faces and names. Uh, I, but I can assure you, they are top quality people who are ready to move in a very positive direction. Thank you. Great. And I um, just want to underscore the importance of your participation in EPO. Air transportation is transportation. It's something that's very important. All of us participate in it. It's an effect on uh, the economies uh, of uh, all of Hampton Roads. So we're really glad to have you down here before you. Sounds great. Thank you. Okay, that completes that. Now we're going to have a regional con uh, connector study, uh, phase two, segment by the commission, and Craig uh, Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. This uh, agenda item seeks to address uh, an omission from the budget that this board approved back in May. Um, the scope of the work was included in that uh, approved action. However, uh, inadvertently, one of the sub-consultants uh, 
cost was uh, omitted from from the budget, and uh, so that cons some consultant has been working, but this seeks to address the uh, the oversight. It amounts to about one hundred six thousand uh, dollars. I feel you deserve an explanation as to how this could happen. Uh, I'm the project manager. I, I remember inputting the budget, but I obviously forgot to save it. When they passed it along to the check, I passed it along to someone who was focused on the uh, workings of the spreadsheet and not so much on who should be having uh, budget items included in this. So we have taken steps to change that quality review process so that this never happens again. But that's how this uh, unfortunate uh, event happened. And uh, with the $106,000, if you look at the components of the phase two budget, we initially had a, an interim budget of about uh, $800,000, and we supplemented it in May for about another 800000 And this is the third component that would bring the total up to just short of $1.7 million. Are there any questions about this action? Any questions? I mean, this would be item 21 of uh, the motion back on the item 49. Okay. Thanks, sir. Okay, next will be a regional legislative agenda. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, well, we, we stand here in mid-summer. It's hard to believe it's time to be talking about General Assembly. <laughs> what we'd like to do today is begin the process and the conversation as we work forward to adopt the regional legislative agenda, both here at the Transportation Planning Organization, but the same process we do later today at the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission. So, Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to do is provide you some information uh, on what that process is going to look like and some suggested topic areas and request your feedback on whether or not we have those correct. Maybe are we addressing the right items? Do you have other ideas, uh, of course, at this meeting to be added to address transportation related items? So here's what our schedule looks like as we move forward. Today we will introduce to both the TPO and PDC board some potential topic areas for our legislative priorities. Um, after that, on August the 28th, uh, this will be the fourth year now that we've done this, that we will have a joint meeting in this room between the Planning District Commission and TPO boards, and we will invite our Hampton Road Caucus members here. Uh, be at 10.30 a.m., we typically do 10.30 to 12.30 with, with, with lunch included. Uh, the last couple years, this has been the best intended Hampton Roads Caucus meeting. Last year we had 15 General Assembly members join us in this room to discuss regional legislative ideas and issues, so this will be your chance to be able to communicate uh, some of your input directly to our caucus members. Then when we get to October and November, that's when both this board as the TPO and the PDC will need to take action. So you can adopt your regional legislative agenda and we can represent that agenda and advocate for the issues important to you as we head into the General Assembly session. Uh, so with that as a brief introduction, let's talk about what we see as the emerging uh, transportation issues uh, this year. And it really starts at the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Project. Now you're aware that that project is fully funded by the HR TAP. Mr. Ripple being chair, our immediate past chair of HR TAP, Mayor Johnson, the current chair of HR TAP, um, and the immediate past vice chair, worked very hard uh, with Director Page to get that project fully funded. But I know you're also aware that it's a $3.8 billion project. And if you look at HR TAP, it's really a portfolio of funding. And any dollar we can bring against this project frees up other HR TAP monies that can be invested in other project areas, like Bowers Hill, like Port Eustis Interchange. Um, and over Virginia Beach is interested in the conversation on independence. So we really think that any efforts that we can do to bring uh, additional dollars to that project is critical. I want to stop and thank the Commonwealth um, for their approval of the smart scale application, which brought state monies um, to the HRBT project. We have two federal applications currently pending. Um, one is a build application, one is an infra application. Uh, one application the federal government is pending for $150 million for the HRBT. 
Uh, the other one is smaller. We were only allowed to ask for $25 million. But nevertheless, $175 million um, would be a, a welcome addition to, to funding that would free up HR tax money for other purposes. Um, we've been working with your federal delegation. Very pleased with Senator Warner, Senator King. Uh, just last week, I see Mr. Lumpkin in the audience. I want to throw out a thank you to him. Um, a lot of work to get their support for our applications um, at the federal level. This week, Congressman Whitman is leading an effort on the House side. We expect that by early next week, we're going to have all of our congressional representatives from Hampton Roads on a letter as well, uh, going to D.C. supporting these applications on our behalf. So we want to continue to try to bring as much outside money to that HRBT project as possible so you can take your local regional tax dollars and apply it to, to, to other projects. Uh, secondly, um, as you're all aware, um, in this, this request initiated in James City County uh, and comes be before you today, first is a recommended legislative agenda item, but in the next item we're going to talk about a resolution to, to have this board go on record. Um, as you're aware, uh, we've been able to fund with a combination of HR TAP monies and some smart scale monies three savings of Interstate 64, but most of that money's come from this region to improve the Interstate 64, savings one, two, and three. There's nine miles left in Hampton Reds um, in segment four of I-64 um, that starts in James City County where it leads off at Lightfoot and goes into New Kent County. We would like the request that the Commonwealth place priority on the completion of that nine mile Interstate 64 segment 4 project in James City and York Commons. Uh, now, where might that funding come from? Fortunately, there was an I 81 funding agreement that was developed coming out of the last General Assembly session. In that agreement, it's our understanding it's going to take a couple of years, Commissioner and the Deputy Secretary Donahue, to get there. But as it ramps up, eventually there ought to be about $27 million per year in that funding agreement that, will, that is dedicated to be allocated somewhere on the I-64 corridor. Now that I-64 corridor runs out to the Charlottesville area, right? We want to make a statement that we think a good place to start when we start investing those things in I-64 is let's start in segment four, and let's start building that gap to Richmond. Um, so we think that's an important legislative priority for us to have, and we're gonna, Mr. Chairman, the next agenda item, we're actually gonna ask for action on that uh, as a resolution of the TPO board. Moving forward, the Smart Scale program has been very good to Hampton Roads. Um, Deputy Secretary Donahue, I want to compliment you and your staff on that work. Um, but boy, when you think about the money you've been able to bring to the 264-64 interchange, the money you've been able to bring to the I-64 corridor, the money we've been able to bring to the high-rise bridge project in 64 Southside, and the $200 million for the HRBT project, in an era of limited funds, um, smart scale's been good. We competed very well because we had maximum congestion relief, um, we're taking our HR TAC money and we are using that as a local match and, and we have very good projects and to be able to take out of a statewide pot of 400 to 500 million we took 200 million for the HRBT project, SOAR scales work very well for Hampton Roads. The challenge is um, we don't believe there's enough money in the SOAR scale program. And we realize there's a lot of competing interests at the state level, but when you have to take a year off because there's just not enough money for smart scale, we think that illustrates that there's not enough funding in that program. We'd like to see the TPO make a statement that the Commonwealth consider increasing funding to the Virginia smart scale program. And then our final item uh, involves around working with DRPT on um, supporting efforts to promote higher speed passenger rail service between Hampton Roads and Rich. Um, had the pleasure of working with the City of Williamsburg staff earlier this week on some strategic planning. And we talked a lot about the importance of that passenger rail station on the peninsula uh, to, to their quality of life and, and, and economic well-being. Clearly on the south side, I, I know Mayor Alexander and you and your staff, uh, see Amy Inman in the audience, work really hard on getting that additional train to Norfolk. 
Um, we have a third train coming to Norfolk, but we've got to get that service moving faster, right? And we think a key part of that is moving towards the Tier 2 environmental impact statement for both the south side and the peninsula. Uh, DRPT tells us that cost is about $24 million, so we'd like to see the resources put around that Tier 2 EIS to be able to allow us to uh, look at projects so we can start advancing to make that rail service a more efficient and reliable uh, mode of choice between Hampton Roads and the main line. Uh, honestly, our concern is things are moving fast from Richmond to D.C. Things are moving fast from Richmond to Raleigh. We don't want to be bypassed, right? In Hampton Roads, we've got to make certain we're part of that main line connection. And we just think these next couple of years are critical to, to keep that project uh, moving forward. Um, I, I just want to mention um, some of the topics that you're partner organization, the PDC, will be looking at later today, um, things that the TPO will be addressing, but they, they'll have details like sea level rise and recurrent flooding, what we can do to promote offshore wind, uh, funding for economic development site readiness, broadband, fiber, Chesapeake Bay areas, UASI emergency management initiatives, even public education funding are all going to be some priority areas that the PDC will be talking about. But those will really join together with the TPO approves and create our full regional legislative agenda. Now I want to say, um, and Mr. Harold and Mr. Trogdon talked about transit. There's other potential items that we're going to want to be thinking about as we move towards approval of our legislative agenda in October and November. We're going to have to be nimble on these items. But um, I'm working with WADA, working with HRDT and our partners, if some things come out of that transformational transit planning project related to transit, obviously we're going to want to uh, be ready to move on those if there's some asks that we need to be making when we get to wintertime in the General Assembly session. And then the second item I mentioned, the Elizabeth River Crossing Task Force, and there is certainly going to be a need as that task force continues its work and reports out to engage with the General Assembly members uh, around uh, any topics that come out of that task force work. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to stop there. Uh, this is no action required on the legislative agenda today. Uh, but what I would request is, is there anything from a transportation standpoint that, that staff is missing as we continue to craft this agenda, looking towards a potential approval in an October, November time frame. So, uh, Chairman Shepard, I'll turn the floor back over to you. Okay, anybody uh, comments or Ms. Uh, Bob thanks uh, to you and staff for putting this together. A list of items that we've in one way or another talked about over the over the months and the years. So I think you've captured a good point of it. Anybody that one, Mr. Chairman? Sure. It's it's a small matter, and maybe it's really just cosmetic. But I'd perhaps like to see maybe K through 12 public education moved at the top. It just shows that we really care about that. We want our general assembly to realize that's a focus point for us as a, as a region. Okay. Great. Any other thoughts? Any objections to or comments, reference, Mr. Tuck's recommendation? Yes, ma'am. I uh, do agree with uh, Mr. Tucker. Uh, this is something that a couple of us are real hard to get on PDC's agenda about five years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, we spoke at the General Assembly. And, we have attended and lobbies are so I do. Yes, sir. Education is key. Of course, we have a lot of things to change versus development. Uh, our retirees, so it really needs to be a large focus for us, everybody. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, great. Yeah, we've been fighting this battle for decades. So, good story. All right, uh, so we'll give you uh, input as we see it, right? So yes, sir. I will be working with your CAO committee as well as we start to put some details around some of these items for your behalf, sir. Okay, good. Now we're going to move into item 14, resolutions for funding for I-64 Peninsula Wide, which Bob's already talked about. This will be segment four. Uh, and then we have the uh, Department of Transportation Budget Office Project Management Committee meeting on October 25, 2018. Your package, you should have seen it pretty much. Bob, you can talk about it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, again, just to restate, our request is that the Commonwealth place priority in the completion of the nine mile 
Interstate 64 segment four project in Jade City and York counties. And again, we believe that the monies allocated to the I-64 corridor from that I-81 funding agreement should be prioritized for investment in this portion of Interstate 64. Now, this is a very quick map, um, and I apologize for this size, but let me let me walk up to it very quickly and say, so this is the Lightfoot intersection. So basically what you're improving now is everything from Lightfoot right down to Jefferson, right? That's what you've all completed. The task at hand now is to go from Lightfoot out to Bottoms Bridge, okay? Um, so that is about 29 miles, 29 miles of what we call, Mr. Shepard, we call the gap, right? Um, over, over the years. Okay. So what we'd like to do is take the first chunk of that. And what we're proposing is this green section, which is saving four. It's nine miles. Um, it picks up where we finished those improvements to Lightfoot. We'd like to see that piece of project be the first area that the state invests in to start, and start building that project the whole way in, um, into New King County and continue on to uh, the Bottoms Bridge area um, near Richmond. Included in your agenda was a resolution. I want to thank Mike Kimball for putting that together. The warehouse statements document the amount of HR TAP money you put into those projects, document the need and the opportunity. Uh, the action statement then is that request that the Commonwealth consider um, prioritizing that area as they invest as I-81 funding agreement projects in Interstate 64. Uh, Mr. Shepard, I know James City County, I've worked with the county administrator and, um, and, and Mr. Hipple on this, uh, perhaps um, that they might have some additional comments to supplement what I, what I provided. But that concludes my comments, uh, sir. Any comments? Yeah, I would like approval on this. The um, it's going to get us outside of our area and, and then do Kent and Richmond all take over from there. But um, I see no need that we should finish and put first that last segment that we have to finish up in um, James City County is that completed. And um, the, I've driven all that quite a few times. The bridges are wide enough, and also the cost won't be as bad as some of the other projects that we've had that that, that had to do bridge work and that sort of thing. So it's more tree removal and filling in and, and widening the road. So it should be a fairly quick project compared to the other tackling it fast. But it would definitely help James City County as far as getting get congestion out of our county and uh, hopefully we can move or New Kent can move do New Kent to head towards Bottom Bridge and get that accomplished as well. So I appreciate the support. We'll get your buddies in your county, right? You already got your <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, so uh, I'll take a motion to uh, approve the resolution. Motion for approval of resolution. You need a second? Second. second. Who's, who's the secretary? Green hand. Green down here. Okay. All right, we got close and second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, All right. Opposed? Okay. Thank you, sir. All right, very good. All right. So we're now item 15. Uh, it's a 2045 long range uh, activity plan scenario planning. Uh, they'll fit. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. So today I'll be providing an update on the scenario planning work that's being conducted as part of our 2045 long range in our regional connector study, and we are seeking board approval on the framework of, for this item. So long-range transportation plans, or LRTPs, are updated every five years to reflect changing conditions in our region. TPO staff has been working on updating our LRTP to the right year of 2045 for the last few years. Uh, the 2025 LRTP needs to be adopted by this board by June of 2021. And we've got several key tasks that are underway currently to help us meet that deadline. And that includes updating our regional travel demand model, developing vision and goals, collecting candidate projects, enhancing our project organization tool, and then developing the framework and tools for our scenario planning process. So in the past, when we've developed our, our LRTPs, we've used predictive planning. We've basically looked at trend lines to try to describe what we expect to happen in the future. Um, and, and one of the things we've learned when you're doing LRTPs and you're looking out 20 plus years, the one thing we're certain of is that we really don't know what's going to happen in the future. There's so many unknown variables. So a better way to approach long-range planning, especially for transportation, is to apply scenario planning. And there's really two fundamental approaches to scenario planning. There's normative and exploratory. 
Normative scenario planning asks what should happen. It describes possible features, still identifies a preferred scenario, and it's prescriptive in nature. And then there's exploratory scenario planning. Instead of asking what should happen, it asks what could happen. It really explores those uncertainties, investigates opportunities and risks for plausible futures. And this is what we're going to be applying in both the 2040 LRTP and in the Regional Connector Study. I just want to highlight that our consultants working on the Regional Connector Study have a lot of expertise in scenario planning. And they've taken the research and regional coordination that we've uh, uh, gathered and they've developed a very robust scope for this process. And they're developing the, the models and tools for this process as well. So with exploratory planning, as I said, it's, it's developing plausible futures. Now we still are taking our, looking at our trend lines to look at what we expect to happen in 2045, and that's going to be our baseline for our 2045 LRTP, similar to what we've done in the past. But for exploratory planning, in addition to this baseline scenario, we are developing three separate and distinct alternative scenarios. Um, and one of the things we want to do with this process is be able to identify those projects that fare best for the region, that have the most cumulative benefit regardless of what happens in the future. And in order to do this, what we'll do is evaluate and rank projects across all of our scenarios. And the projects that do best in each of these scenarios will be identified as our most robust projects for the region, and those are the ones we're going to look to physically constrain into our 2045 LRTP. So one of our key goals in developing the scenario planning process where we wanted our models for this process to be objective and data-driven, much like our project prioritization tool. So we're going to have three key models that we use for this process, which includes a land use model, our updated regional travel land model, and an economic model. And these models are all designed to be able to interact with each other, and they'll produce outputs and performance measures that ultimately will feed into our project prioritization tool, which will evaluate and rank our projects based on project utility, economic vitality, and project viability. Again, highlighting those, those most robust projects for the region and the smartest investments for our region. So the scenario planning framework, which we've been working on uh, since the beginning of the year to develop, is a good checking point, because this framework is really going to drive the analysis moving forward. And there's really three key elements of the framework. It's the regional place types, the scenario narratives, and a greater growth control total, which I'll go over into more detail in the next few slides. So the regional place types is a unified set of data that describes regional development patterns. This data is based on existing and future land use data that was provided by locality staff, and it is consistent with locality comprehensive plans. The regional place types are quantitative in nature, and the densities of these place types have been reconciled against our board-approved uh, transportation analysis zones. These place types are key in the scenario planning process because these are the ones that will help us identify where growth can occur in the region. And as such, we have worked closely with your locality staff to make sure that the place types the data is up to date and that it is accurate. So we've also worked with our regional stakeholders to develop drivers, identify drivers or disruptors for the region. And these are essentially elements that can highly influence how the region develops um, and, and impact the transportation system. And we've worked with, with these members to organize these drivers into spatial themes, which you see on this slide. So we have greater growth on the water which asks what happens if jobs focus on the waterfront, housing choices are varied, and transportation technology adoption is moderate. And we have greater growth in urban centers, which asks what happens if jobs and housing focus in urban areas with greater multimodal availability and a high adoption of connected vehicle technology. And then finally, greater suburban or greenfield growth, which asks what happens if jobs and housing are developed in dispersed activities across the region, a higher level of truck transportation, <coughs> and a high level of autonomous vehicle technology. And within these themes, our drivers have to be distinct, again, because we want to make sure our scenarios are distinct. And there's different assumptions for the port, the military, uh, demographic composition, uh, transportation technology, et cetera. So what we've done is we've refined these themes into scenario narratives that you can see on this slide. And again, uh, the, the critical thing is that we make sure the narratives are distinct so that we can properly test transportation benefits. And essentially, the greater growth on the water scenario narrative will test uh, that greater cross-harbor travel in particular. The greater growth in urban centers is designed to test more urban and multi travel patterns. And then the greater suburban or greenfield growth scenario is designed to test more overall regional tra 
travel. And I'd like to note, in each of these scenarios, we'll, we'll also be looking at the impacts of uh, sea level rise, and we're going to assume the same three-foot sea level rise for all scenarios. And the final component of our scenario planning framework is the greater growth control totals. Um, one of the things we're doing with the scenario is we, we want to be able to stress test transportation al alternatives, and that's why we're looking at adding growth in the three alternate scenarios, specifically to employment, this population will respond uh, depending on how much employment we add. And the overall goal in adding or identifying this greater growth control total is to make sure, again, that we are differentiating between the scenarios. If we pick too little growth, we can dilute the differences. Too much growth, we can mask these differences. And ultimately, this additional growth for these scenarios must be plausible. So with a lot of research and coordination, again, with our committees, uh, what we're recommending is a 16% increase over 2015. And as you can see on the graphic at the right, uh, for our 2045 baseline, for employment, we're adding 8% uh, to the 2015 numbers. So for our greater growth alternative scenarios, what we're suggesting is to add an additional 8% on top of the 2045 baseline. So it would be a total of 16% over our 2015 employment numbers. So as I stated throughout this presentation, there was a lot of coordination and input to get to this point. Uh, we've held a couple of workshops, we've held multiple webinars, numerous emails, conference calls, uh, meeting briefings uh, to various locality staff, different committees, um, the consultants, etc. Uh, this data has been reviewed and approved by the Long Range Transportation Plan Subcommittee, our Transportation Technical Advisory Committee, the Regional Connector Study Working Group, and the Regional Connector Study Steering Committee. Uh, the framework was also out for public review and comment between July 3rd and 17th. We did not receive any public comments. So the recommended action under consent uh, agenda item 23B will be to approve the regional scenario planning fra framework, which includes the place types, the scenario narratives, and a greater growth control total of 16% in 2015 as a starting point that can be increased up to 21% um, if, if it's deemed necessary. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions you may have. Our starting uh, transportation network will be a 2026 uh, year, so it assumes all the improvements up through uh, <coughs> HRBT and improved HRBT. Okay, good. Um, and what would be, I noticed um, in some of the scenarios here, you're talking about the different growths and that sort of thing. What will be the equal between, say, Virginia Beach and like Sussex, the different growth patterns? Is there, is there a way to figure out that the Virginia Beach course is growing larger and bigger than any of us. And um, so what would be the equal between a smaller community and a larger community? So that's where the place types really come into play. Um, the place types, um, we're going to use our land use model to be able to highlight compatibility and suitability. And based on the scenario narrative and the type of growth that we're adding to the region based on that narrative, then we'll, the growth will be assigned to place types specific to that narrative. So for instance, for the greater growth on the water, some of the place types that are designed to absorb more growth, more growth that's where you would see more growth in, the, in those localities on the water. For the urban centers, it'll be throughout the region, say in the suburban and, and Greenville. So it's not one straight answer, it just depends on that scenario narrative, but the place types are key to that. Okay. Um, the 16 to 21%, that's 8% more. And how did you get that? How did you come up with that number? And we can add 21. Would that skew this whole thing if we add the 21? Is that going to is that going to skew our numbers and, and throw that out of place? So um, coming up, the, the initial range that we looked at for potential greater growth control totals was 12 to 21 percent, and that was looking at historical data, looking at various uh, forecast sources for the region, the state, the nation. Um, then our consultants got some feedback from our, our various committees, did some travel model sensitivity, and that's how we arrived at a starting point of 16% um, because it, it was enough to move the needle so that we could see results from the scenario planning. 
um, and have enough distinction between the scenarios, but we gave ourselves enough cushion that we could go up to that high end of 21% if we felt like there wasn't enough distinction as we're applying growth in the region. Um, that high end of 21%, though, assumes that Hampton Roads will be keeping pace with Northern Virginia, so it really is stretching that sort of plausibility notion to go any higher than that. Okay, and that won't skew our numbers as far as, you know, I, I know a lot of studies, if, if, well, we can't hit it at 16, let's raise it to 21, and our whole number is not changing. And, and so that's why I'm sure that no. it's not changing, you know, okay, I needed to fit here, so let me go to 21% instead of 16. Correct, no, it will, will not change yet. The only reason we'll need to move up from the 16% is if we just don't feel like there's enough distinction to evaluate transfer benefits, but it won't impact negatively the scenario planning process. Okay. And I'm glad to see that you um, put not only for our bases, but for our residents, the uh, free <coughs> so we can start planning on if we need to have the roads higher, transportation higher, we need to put it in place now, not wait to have that. Right, especially since we're looking at horizon of 2045 and those investments will be around even longer than that. Sure. Any other comments, questions? Yes, sir. Uh, could you do, first of all, I thought this is just a, uh, an amazing approach, something that's taken me a long time to get my head around. Uh, and in our steering committee meeting, we, we kept asking you questions and, and criticizing about making Christmas <coughs> questions, questions about how it would predict. And you kept explaining over and over that this is not a predictive study. Could you kind of, you know, comment on that and that whole concept how it's a different mindset for just a right and that and that's the whole basis of, of exploratory scenario planning it's not to predict the future instead it is really just to sort of identify what are the uncertainties in our region what are those things that we really think can impact how we grow and can ultimately impact the transportation system so uh, exploring what those risks and opportunities are and, and, and seeing what some some potential consequences are but none of these scenarios um, you know, and of course we have to make them very distinct from each other to test the transportation benefits. But in no way are we saying that any one scenario is going to be what we think the future should look back, look like. And in fact, it could be a combination of, of two, three, or even all these scenarios on, on how our region may develop. Um, so it is just to explore um, drivers. It is not to predict what what is going to look like in the future. Okay. So as uh, Ms. Diss said, it's going to be on the consent agenda. Agenda item 23B. Press that pin. We'll now move on to item 16. This is the regional express lane update. Now, uh, Commissioner Rich uh, was going to apologize and has to no, you're not. I'm going to apologize for this because we asked him to come back up here and give the briefing. The purpose, he's given this briefing to the HR TAC and in various forms. I think Chris may have given a version of this earlier, but it's a little complicated. It's important. Not everyone's heard it, so uh, if I ask you to give it again, and uh, I, I know there's folks in here that haven't heard it. If you have heard it, maybe this will help sink in, I guess. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good morning. This is the same exact uh, presentation that I did give, did give to the Hampton Roads or the HR attack uh, back on June. Uh, or June 20th uh, last month concerning our Plymouth, and I want to preface this, this is our preliminary results <coughs> uh, on the regional network study. But before I, before I get into the presentation, I do want to acknowledge that the region has moved forward with a number of significant investments in regional projects to benefit the quality of life here in Hampton Roads. And I certainly, I, I hope you will find that the outcome of this study is going to show what truly what that impact is back to the region. The good news is too that I think you're going to see that the, the investments that you have made do have a significant impact, but I think there are five very targeted investments that could maximize your investment that I'll show you here within this presentation. Before I get into this, I do want to show you uh, the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel and the significant benefit that the HRBT will provide to the region. This is a uh, travel time comparison graph just showing what I'll call segment three, which is our Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel project. And it's a travel time graph starting from the left-hand side of, from Mercury Boulevard heading in the eastbound direction through the HRBT in, and into 564. The upper line represents 
the current condition of a no-build situation, which would be two general purpose lanes traveling through uh, the HRBT in 2025 at opening year. The bottom line is what, you, what we're buying for our $3.8 billion project, and that is two general purpose lanes, and that is your upper line, uh, <coughs> indicating two general purpose line lanes at that point, and then during the peak period, we will also have two uh, managed lanes or two hot lanes. Assuming that the same demand for the HRBT is in existence if it was built in 2025, if we did do nothing for that, that's our upper line. Our citizens in the Hampton Roads area would be sitting in traffic for more than two hours waiting to get through there. Again, this is an illustrious of, uh, presentation assuming that the same demand for the fully built HRBT exists to go through the current two-lane uh, HRBT. This is, this is the exact same pre or scenario. Now it's comparing just the eastbound uh, direction again in the PM period of 2025. And the travel time savings is about 48 minutes, 40% 40 reduction, and that's assuming a, a direct comparison to our free option, which is our general purpose lanes. This is a this travel time graph is now in the from the Norfolk side to the Hampton side, showing a, from the 564 interchange up to Mercury Boulevard. This is just this shows that if we have one on-ramp into the hot lane at Granby Street, we will continue to carry two GP lanes through the HRBT and two hot lanes. We continue to have a significant reduction in travel time for our citizens. So hopefully you'll see that the investment that has been made to date uh, for the HRBT is a very powerful one for the region. But recognizing that when we came in about 18 months ago, we, had this, we saw that we have a number of regional projects underway, the high-rise bridge, the HRBT, and we've looked at that in a very independent utility model. But the region has endorsed a managed lane concept back in 2017. That managed lane concept looks at things as a system rather than a set of projects in individual utility. So the purpose of this operational evaluation is to look at the 40-mile network, roughly from 664 to Bowers Hill, in a system manner. Uh, the other aspect of this is recognizing part of the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel Project has the requirement for a master tolling agreement. So we wanted to make sure that the contents of an operational study are well documented and well known to be able to make form decisions as we develop that master tolling agreement. As we said, that uh, our, we have two cases in this. We have a base case, which we're calling an, an enhanced case in our evaluation. Outright, the base case is what we've bought. We have the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel with two general purpose lanes and two managed lanes in the peak period. Uh, we will come around from the HRBT Okay, we'll come through the, from Settler's Landing to the HRBT, we have a <coughs> series of, or a reversible network of HRB lanes, hot lanes today. We'll come through the 264 interchange where it's an HOB facility right now. Uh, in this base model, we will continue to have that as an HOB facility, and then we will pick up managed lanes through the uh, high-rise bridge. In our enhanced system, let me back up even further. In our enhanced system, we're only making two changes to this. We're proposing to move the current location for the ingress into the managed lanes that we currently have at Settler's Landing back a mile and a half to closer to LaSalle. And the second change in the enhanced case is to convert the HOV facility, as you see, from 264 to 464 
to a managed lane or a hot lane connection. So before I go any further, are there any questions between what we're calling a base case scenario and a enhanced case scenario? Questions? Okay. So the whole purpose of this is to see how the network's going to operate on opening day in 2025 when HRBT comes in on time and on budget. <laughs> Or as the second year would say, I had to schedule another budget, so uh, I'm, I'm keeping it set for all time on budget. So you don't need to spend any time on this slide. Long and short of it is, VDOT has worked in collaboration with the TCO and HR TAC staff to be able to develop what we have as, as part of the assumptions and the models that uh, we have developed. Before I get into individual comparisonal analysis, I want to start with taking you through the corridor and really starting from the standpoint of starting at Mercury Boulevard on the left hand side of your chart, going all the way through the network, the 40 miles all the way down to Bowers Hill. What you're seeing on this graph are those two base scenarios. We will have built the HRBT with two general purpose lanes and two hot lanes. And that's your upper graph. In this case, we're starting at Settlers Landing under the current contract, moving easterly through the network. And this is, again, for the, the 2025 eastbound PM. You'll see this section being highlighted. This is our HOV facility between 264 and uh, 464, remaining as an HOV facility, not a HAP facility. The major takeaway with this is our two points. One, moving the sort location or the ingress into the hot network by a mile and a half westerly from the current location, Settlers Landing, to LaSalle, or close to LaSalle, we're able to start saving travelers through the HRBT about 50 minutes extra save, travel time savings in a direct comparison between our general purpose lanes to our general purpose lanes from those two scenarios. The second item is as I come through and convert, potentially convert that HOV facility and tap into the unused capacity of that HOV facility, we're able to continue to show a separation between our general purpose lanes and our managed lanes. In any way, shape, or form, we're able to save significant amount of travel time by, by two simple changes to our, our network. So as I get into this, as I indicated, we've already made a significant investment into our in, into the region, just simply by our Hampton Road Bridge Tunnel 264 interchange and now the High Rise Bridge. But what we found is that there's an opportunity to make five very targeted investments into the network to maximize that, that investment that's already been made by the region. There are two in the AM period that we see, and that's at the HRBT and the potential in and around our reversible network. And there are three in the PM, which is the same place at the HRBT, our high-rise bridge, and then our westbound direction at the HRBT, predominantly on the Norfolk side. And I'll walk through each of these hotspot locations. The first one, you'll see, this is a diagram indicating as I travel from 664 eastbound to 564, we're seeing two points of friction. Our first point of friction in our general purpose lanes again is in around the Mallory Street Settlers Landing location, and this is just simply the friction point where we're going from three lanes down to two, necking it down, and then having Settlers Landing uh, traffic enter into the general purpose lanes and creating a friction point. The second part of this, and, and I will say this is systemic or sy systemic and symptomatic of both the AM and the PM period. But what we will see is that in a scenario two, we have an opportunity to reduce this friction point 
and, and relieve that friction at that particular location. Now in the AM period, again, in the eastbound direction, we see that there's going to be a friction point simply at 564. Recognize that our reversible lanes right now are, are taking our, a significant amount of traffic along 64 and moving that traffic into the base along 564. So there is no, so what we have here is two general purpose lanes and we will have two hot lanes merging into the existing two lanes across that, into the 564 interchange moving in the eastbound direction. The good news is we have some ideas on how to fix this and I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about that in the next slide. So this is the segment, again, in the eastbound direction from 564, commuting all the way down to 264. You're going to say, hey, these, guys, these lines look almost identical. Well, they should, because there is no opportunity today to move any of our added capacity or added throughput or volumes that we would have along this section of roadway because the reversible lanes are in the westbound direction in the AM and our traffic here is in the, in the eastbound direction. But this gives us an opportunity to repurpose our shoulder lane on the inside lane, we think, to be able to provide a managed lane from 564 through the 264 interchange during the peak period. Uh, we'll call it a part-time shoulder lane. We'll need to take a look at whether or not we can expand that into a 24-7 operation. But uh, this would allow us to operate uh, along the reversible network in the opposite direction and provide an option for people to be able to travel in a managed lane capacity. Certainly will help us create reliability in both directions, for, I think both the general purpose lanes as well as our managed lane, and help us in the region be able to create a 24-7 bi-directional network. So going back to the third uh, hotspot, as I'll call it, continues to be that sort location associated with at, at Settler's Landing. As I indicated, we think that there's a significant opportunity to take the existing contract, which has the entranceway into the managed lanes currently at the Settler's Landing location, and just simply moving that back by about a mile and a half closer to LaSalle Avenue. We're thinking, or the analysis has shown, that we're able to reduce the travel times between the general purpose or the free option between these two options by about 53 minutes. And again, this is just moving from Mercury Boulevard eastbound to 564. So a mile and a half back or westerly to be able to save 50 minutes of travel time through the HRVT in the in the PM direction. Our fourth hotspot location is right there within the HOV facility uh, from 264 to 464. From 264 to 464. Recall that the HOV facility is operating with a travel time indicating this. When we repurpose that and convert that to an HO hot facility, there's an opportunity to tap the unused capacity within that lane to be able to provide people a, an option to be able to travel. What that's going to do is reduce the demands in the general purpose lanes, increase the speed in the general purpose lanes, and allow for travel really to be almost in an equal, equalized fashion. Now, interesting enough, on this particular location, the 464 interchange becomes an issue when we're heading in the eastbound direction and travel is going eastbound to either Chesapeake along 168 or northbound on 464. What we're seeing is traffic that is in the general purpose lanes are stopped, backed up in the general purpose lanes, and the HOV facility is backed up as well if they need to get over. By creating 
a hot facility, we're able to allow people that were no, not allowed to be in the HOV facility an option to be in the HO, hot facility and have a bypass around to stop traffic into that interchange. Now, what I'll say about the 464 interchange, this is something that we are not looking at. I think this is something that the region will need to take a look at in longer terms, uh, just to be able to have the, to allow the throughput in the general purpose lanes to, at, at some future point, uh, to be unencumbered. But by creating that, that added, um, option for motors to use as they approach uh, the high-rise bridge, we're seeing continued separation of travel time between the general purpose lanes and the managed lanes. And our final uh, hotspot location that we have is, is from the Grandy Street location heading north or westbound through the HRVT at opening day. What we see right now is that we do have two travel lanes opening up into a, a managed facility which will cons continue to consist of two <coughs> lanes. But we have one entrance point right now that is metering traffic, if you will, into the hot lanes. We're looking at an opportunity right now to extend the opening or the entranceway into the hot facility prior to the 564 interchange to be able to allow, to give options back to motors in, in Norfolk for traveling in the westbound direction, an opportunity to enter the hot facility prior to the 564 interchange and again at the Granby Street. So we have an ongoing analysis to be able to identify, I get that reloaded real quick. So we have an opportunity to allow for traffic to now get into uh, the hot facility managed lanes prior to 564 and again offer another opportunity to enter the facility at the Granby Street location which will give more opportunity to reduce this what I'll we'll call a, a hot spot location. One thing that I will caution with a heat map, and I, and I, and I, I brought it up at the HR tag meeting, this looks ominous. It, it's not that bad. It's not as ominous as what it looks like. We will, it will reduce congestion. This is just a direct comparison of what the anticipated speeds along that section would be. Uh, and I will say that a volume of about 100 vehicles an hour will change something from a bright red to a light yellow to an almost green. So this is the, the heat maps that we're showing are very sensitive to traffic volumes and changes, but we do think that uh, our analyses that we're continuing to perform will alleviate this at this particular location. So what are our next steps in, in the evaluation? Certainly, we're going to take a look at what that sort location, again, at, at LaSalle means um, and, and continue to analyze that. We're going to evaluate the repurposing of that shoulder lane from 564 to 264 in both directions, not just in the eastbound direction, but also in the westbound direction, recognizing the reversible lanes are, are flowing in reverse directions during certain peak periods. Again, trying to accomplish a 24-7 network of, of managed lanes. So we're also going to look at our operational analysis or hours. We're going to look at the weekdays during the off-peak and how does a hot lane affect traffic through the region. We know that it's going to create a more reliable system for users and give options to users. But we'll take a look at that as well as recognizing that our summer weekends here are just as bad as some of our peak periods. Saturdays and Sundays trying to travel through the HRVT is no different than 5 p.m. on a Friday, on a Thursday or Friday afternoon. Um, we're also going to look at a fully hot two network versus a hot three network. When we started this evaluation, the HRVT was under the P3 development. 
uh, legislation, which required anything as a P3 contract be a POT3 network. So the results that I'm showing today are assuming that the HRBT is a POT3 and the rest of the network is a POT2, which is consistent with our reversible lanes that we have today. We will come back to this board as well as HR TAC, assuming a fully POT2 network and a fully POT3 network. We're also looking at other regional considerations that you may have that we have not identified. I think we have moved quite forward. I have not heard anything, any other uh, permutations that we needed to run or, or suggested to run. But all these analyses that you see here, the next steps and, and the additional analysis, we will have back and available to both the HR TAC and the TPO. I think we have a joint meeting scheduled now for September 19th. We will have all of those results in a final form back to you to be able to be presented uh, for you. Moving forward, we see that from that we'll have a, a, a tolling regime that will be presented forward and we should have our traffic and revenue forecast for a hot two, hot three network uh, ready to share at that point and then have the regional decisions that can be made in the November, December time frame to help us formulate what the master tolling agreement should look like. Uh, what I will say that, that I do believe in my mind that there are a couple of questions that the region's going to need to be answering. Uh, first off is whether it's going to be a hot two or a hot three network. Uh, the hours of operation, we're going to suggest that it's a 24 seven hot network to be able to create reliability back in, into, the, into the network. And then whether or not to convert the HOV facility between 264 and 464 into a hot network or be income part of it. With that being said, I think I know that there are probably a number of questions with regard to the presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much for the, uh, for the presentation again. You can see it's a little complicated uh, and uh, it looks like it's been very promising, so we look forward to the, uh, the follow up. So, any questions? Yes, yes sir. Chairman, and I uh, thank the Commissioner for his presentation. Uh, for those of you who have not seen this presentation before, um, when he presented to HR TAC, he did ask a number of questions. He said he would come back in September with analysis for some of the questions and concerns. But I do have just a couple of concerns. And since your presentation to HR TAC, um, on the 26th of June, I was coming back from uh, downtown Washington, D.C., and left there probably unfortunately around 5 o'clock. So as I was saw one of the signs on, on 395 and said, I think Garrisonville will just wear like the hot lane or the hot network ends and comes back into regular traffic. And there was a sign that said 12 miles, 40 minutes. And this was in the four lanes and I'm running parallel to where you've got the hot lanes and you know, pay as you go which suggests the average speed was around 18 to 19 miles per hour. Well, Monday a week ago, as I was trying to get from Elothian here for the resiliency committee meeting, which started at 5.30, maybe I didn't leave Elothian enough time, but around 4.30 or so, I was around Bland Boulevard, and I saw a sign that said, um, HRBT, 15 miles, 50 minutes. So we're still looking at roughly 18 miles per hour. And so I guess my question is really, and uh, I have concerns about starting your sort at LaSalle, but I'm trying to figure out how you get this reduction when in Northern Virginia you've got your ideal situation of people who don't want to sit in traffic being able to pay, and yet I'm sitting in traffic with all the other people, and I'm only moving about 18 miles per hour. Now I get to my own area, and this is where it goes from three lanes to four, because you've got the HOV two, and I'm still moving at 18 miles per hour. And you're saying that there are these individuals who are going to not want to sit in traffic, and whatever speed they're able to go at, I now have all these other folks now who were at least in three lanes up until uh, about 
four miles from the entrance to the tunnel. You're moving the sort back a mile and a half. And all of a sudden, we're all going to be traveling at what speed? And I, I don't, I'm not sure we'll get that speed. Now, the other part that concerns me is now you are at 254 mile marker, roughly, just playing Boulevard. You have now gone, you created your HOV two lane. When you get down around the 264 and a half mile mark, I do believe, where 664 comes into 64, you terminate that HOV lane, so we all become three. Now, if I am comfortably traveling at whatever speed because I can get past all these vehicles, now I have to merge back in with these other vehicles for maybe about a mile and a half until I get back into my managed lane. I'm not sure if, if maybe you ought to continue that HOV lane all the way through. Now, the challenge you have, and I was with the York County, Jameson County folks who said, well, on the peninsula, we don't see that much demand for managed lanes, particularly coming westbound, so we don't want to see, or don't think there's a need for managed lanes coming all the way out of the tunnel, proceeding up to, I guess, Jefferson Avenue in that area. But what about going eastbound? I don't know if my friends from York County and James D. County would say, hey, we want to start now charging people to enter there and to go all the way down in a straight lane. I just, I just don't know. And I'm not comfortable. And the day I was sitting in that traffic, I was sending pictures to Mayor Johnson because I'm saying, OK, here's where 664 entrance is, and here's where it comes back into the interstate, and here's where things end, and here's all this traffic. And by the time you actually get to LaSalle Avenue, where you're talking about creating this new sort, that's where traffic is starting to normalize because you've gone actually from one point from six lanes down to three. And now you want to take one of those lanes away and leave both two. And I'm not sure that you're going to enhance what you're trying to do if you're sorted at that point. Now, what you're saying, you think this sort should be further up towards Jefferson? I'm thinking maybe, because all I'm seeing is that at that point, you're just moving the congestion back. And, and I know your analysis shows that you'll reduce things, what, uh, 50 minutes and, and have this great reduction. I think moving that sort of just a mile and a half back, as I said, it's your attack. What you're doing is you're taking what used to exist up at Land Boulevard, but you went from three lanes to two, or actually went to four all the way down to two. Now you're flipping that and taking your four lanes and making it to two down at, at uh, LaSalle. Just a comment on that, you mentioned Low County. I think the comment we had when we originally talked about this was that we had no rationale for doing anything otherwise. Okay? But if there's a rationale for doing it, for example, why would we jam up a, a good tunnel for $3.6 million dollars over a point like that? That, that we couldn't possibly be a good point to do it. But I mean, other than that, uh, at the time when it was presented, there was just no rationale. Because what we see is all you do is upset the folks you know, for one reason. And it just doesn't see it yet, it's a big demand. But if you got a reason and you gotta get across the tunnel to make the sort earlier, that's a good reason. Showing that out there. So any other questions? Yes. Okay. Um I wouldn't see Jefferson, I would see Mercury as a as a balance because you got the capacity there to sort and move out. I see what you're saying as far as you know, once you get down there, you're in a girdle and it's hard to get through that girdle. Um, where if it was further up, you know, and did Mercury, it still gives you enough room to figure out where you're going before you get there and move over and get into those. I think Jefferson would be too far and probably <coughs> cause more problems, in my opinion, for people traveling in your area down there to get around and get through rather than Mercury probably be the easier. Right if we need that, you know, I can see where you probably need that extra space. You know, because once you get to LaSalle, if, if you're not there, 
you know where you're, you're in traffic. So I mean, the idea is that you can move, you move it over to that area. You don't have to be stuck until the south. So. Okay, the other questions? We have, we have to finish up with our agenda here. Um, any questions? Okay. If I may, um, Commissioner, sure. thank you for, for that briefing and, and that overview. Um, Mr. Shepard, there's, there's two potential topic points I, I might like to introduce and, and suggest if the chair is okay uh, permission, I, I'd like to make certain we discuss. One is, um, as a TPO staff, we believe that we can offer some support and collaborative work with the department to move forward to try to give you as much clear and concise information as possible to help you make a decision come fall on disinformation. Um, what we would like to do as a TPO staff is the department's model for 2025 and what this network's going to look like when it opens. Um, we'd like to do some analysis out to 2040. And, and because I think that you know, what things look like in 2025, Mayor, that you're pointing out, and Mr. Hipple, you know, you've got growth and, and what, what, you're making a generational investment here. Which our tax talked a lot about that, the TPOs talked a lot about that. We'd like to give you an analysis that complements what VDOT's doing to really take a look at the point for the model. And with the chair's permission, I think uh, Mr. Kimbrell could walk through that very, very quickly for us, if that would be okay. Mr. Chair, I'm going to show you what. From there, the second item is I know the other question that's come up is. These express lanes, how are those reflected in the HR TAP plan of finance? And I know Mr. Page um, is, is prepared to do a quick overview on that as well. So Mr. Shepard, we're going to be able to get all those in 18 minutes and get to the next meeting. I believe we could. I believe we could do this in 15 minutes, sir. We get to the motion. Go ahead. Let's go give it a shot. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very briefly, uh, as Bob mentioned, we are proposing with this information uh, by doing some work with HRT Joe staff looking out into 25 years because these are large investments that we're making and it's helpful to know what it's going to look like when it opens but we also think we need to look a little further out to make sure that you know in 25 years from now what what would that look like you know if we end up with a lot of clogged general purpose lands then maybe it's a good idea to reserve a uh, an option for a reliable trip. So that could help us make this hot lanes uh, uh, decision. So what we propose to do is use our new HRTPO travel demand model. This model includes a component for managed lanes analysis. It's the first model that we've had that, that includes this component. Uh, we'd like to test uh, two uh, cases for 2045 conditions. One we are calling the baseline, which would be Assuming we had just all, all the new capacity of HRBT and the high-rise projects are just general purpose lanes. This gives us a baseline to compare against. And then we'd like to do the second case, which is a managed lanes network, similar to what the commissioner and uh, others of VDOT have been describing. Uh, we'd be cross-coordinating with VDOT staff. Uh, we'd be doing the macro modeling on this, which is using our travel demand model. And then we'd be working with VDOT to take the output from that modeling effort and put it into their micro modeling to talk about things like where should the sorting points be and then things like that where you have to put them on micro level. So in the baseline, as I said, all the, all the <coughs> new capacity at the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel and the High Rise Bridge would be assumed to be general purpose lanes. So no managed lanes there for the baseline scenario. As you can see on the map, the colored lines indicate uh, the gray is the general purpose lanes. We've got the red for the current hot lanes. That's the reversible lane section. And then the blue is the current HOV lanes down, down in the Greenbrier area. For our analysis, we're actually uh, recommending that we assume that the, the HOV lines in the Greenbrier area be converted to hot two lanes. And one reason for that is because currently what you have is a hot two section in the reversible lanes. And if you're heading uh, from you know, heading in the uh, eastbound direction, you run out the end of those hot two lanes and, and you've paid and you think you're legal and you run right into an HOV lane where you're not allowed to be if you're only one individual. In the so 
we're thinking for consistency purposes, it would be a good idea to go ahead and convert that HOV lane to a hot two lane so it's consistent with the general, with the, uh, with the reverse of that main section. Uh, so that was going to be one of our uh, assumptions for our baseline study. Now for the managed lanes network, it's really simple. Uh, we've got the red line that goes all the way from the Hamp Roads Bridge Tunnel Project all the way around to Bowers Hill. It's a hot lanes network. In order to be a connected hot lanes network, that means that you have to have those shoulder lanes that Commissioner Bridge mentioned adjacent to the reversible lane section. So that when reversible lanes are uh, in the eastbound direction, you have a, a shoulder lane going in the westbound direction so you can stay in the hot lanes network and vice versa. Now we are also talking about looking at this as, as strictly a hot, a hot two network. Again, we think it's important to be consistent. If you have a piece of the network that's hot three and another piece that's hot two, then you, know, you can be legal in one and ride right into the next one without realizing it and be illegal all the same. So we're, consistent, we're talking about using consistent hot two uh, network when we look at uh, the management concept. In terms of assumptions, uh, the first one is a uh, question mark. Uh, the western terminus of the hot operation. We just had a short discussion here about where that should be. We have the South Avenue in here. That's what's been discussed so far as a possible sorting point. If you think that we should be looking a little bit further west at Mercury or further up, it would be helpful to know that so that we model the same way you have in mind uh, from the beginning. As we move down the table, uh, we would be looking at uh, the possibility of part-time shoulder general purpose lanes between that LaSalle Avenue sorting point and Settlers Lane Road. Um, we have really all these cost estimates on here I want to point out are very preliminary cost estimates. Some of these depend on what we really do. Uh, for that first one with the part-time shoulder lane between LaSalle and Settlers Landing, if you can fit that shoulder lane in with the existing Hampton River bridges, it's not going to cost anywhere near $300 million. Uh, if you have to widen the bridges, it could be close to $300 million to, to add that part-time shoulder lane. We're talking about evaluating it both ways, with and without the part-time shoulder lane, just to see what we get. Do you need that part-time shoulder lane to make this work or not? As we move further down, we have the direct connecting ramps between the HOV to HOV uh, or hot lanes into the I-564 HOV lanes. Uh, there's the, the current HRVT project doesn't include the direct connecting ramps from the hot lanes on the 564. There is an option where that could be added to the project. Uh, the, the latest cost estimate we've seen is around 115 to 120 million dollars for that. Again, preliminary cost estimate. We're going to evaluate it both ways. We're going to evaluate the networks. Without the connecting ramps, 564 and with we'll see what we get. And, and, and you'll be able to see the difference between those and whether it's worth making that kind of investment for what you get. Moving further down the table, again, part-time shoulder lanes parallel to the reversible lane section. We need that in order to have a two-way hot lanes network. Uh, this, this cost us, and again, it's very preliminary. My understanding is it could be significantly less than this. But we want to provide these, this information to, because it's important to know there is a cost involved with a lot of these uh, different features that you might have to do to make a hot lanes network. And finally, uh, of course, these determinants for the solar network would be a valid. So, in terms of presenting the results of evaluation, I apologize. Uh, if I could interrupt a second, Mike, could you go back a second, please? Um, I, I, I know that the meeting has gone long. But it's really important. Is the cell Avenue a good assumption, or is there another location? I, I really think that's an important issue. Move uh, back to Mercury. I think the cell and the choke point. I think it was the choke point too. He's moved back to Mercury. I mean, it's just, we had no rationale for doing that earlier. We have talked about this now for months, and uh, I mean, do we have a rationale for looking back to Mercury? So move back to Mercury. I guess you just get moving this time. The only reason I say that is, again, you know, I don't know how much traffic gets off of LaSalle and trying to get on the 64 at that point. But again, just observing traffic and, and knowing that area, you're going from six lanes at Mercury and where you're going towards 664 
you're going down to three lanes just after 664 comes back in, which is 264 and a half mile marker. You've got the exit for LaSalle, which is 265, comes back on about a half mile later. So when you start just right there at that point, you've got a lot going on, and you've got three lanes of traffic, and you're taking away one of the general purpose lanes, and you're forcing people to make a decision to get over. And, and I just see a, a, a backup. From that point now, you're just moving it back a mile and a half. Well, the only one's not here, and, and uh, you know, you missed, you missed the shot. So let's take a look at, really, let's take it back to Mercury. Most of the folks on the south side don't care. But uh, what we do, and uh, let's just do that, OK? I mean, they, I know the guys over here have to go that the military have to travel that, so it's, it's a lot of folks going across. This will make it complete. I agree with, I agree with uh, Donnie. Okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Mr. Chairman, just a point of clarification on the part-time shoulder lanes for the reversible section. We do have, you're showing 300 million up there. I just want to point out that I, I believe maybe my prior comments with regard to converting the reversible lanes bi-directional it was taken out of context certainly I did say that we would be significantly less than 300 million for part-time shoulder lanes so I, I before the group leaves or the board departs for today I let's recognize that the part-time shoulder lanes along that reversible section are going to be significantly less than one any conversion of the bi-directional roadway to or the reversible roadway to bi-directional and the 300 million there is shown is, is very excessive from our preliminary cost estimate which I have not shared yet uh, we're still in the development phase but it's significantly less than the 300 million so I, I prefer that that be denoted today we, we, we recognize the fact this is this, this will be fine tuned this yes. is just kind of and, and this is a big guess right now. The, the cost estimates that you're showing up there, certainly whether or not we need to widen the Hampton River bridges to be able to accommodate something that I committed to back at, at HR TAC, as well as the reversible lanes, we will have that information readily available for the September meeting. Very good. Hi. Anything else? Okay, so in terms of presenting the results, there's going to be a number of different visualizations for doing this. I think that when you get to some of the microanalysis in terms of what does it look like when you move the sorting points, uh, there will probably be some video simulation where you can see the differences with kind of traffic moving along and see what it really looks like. But one thing we thought we'd do is also provide a pretty basic way of looking at this. This is almost like Mayor Todd was suggesting, I mean, was, was referring to earlier when he saw these signs and said, to go from here to there, it's going to be this long. So we thought, why don't we do something like that? You know, we put, put up the baseline for, for this section. This example is during the AM peak hour, 2045 conditions from now Mercury Boulevard to, to 564. And how many minutes does that take? And then looking at the managed lanes component, how many minutes does that take? Whether you're in the age of uh, the hot lanes uh, or whether you're in the general purpose lanes. So you can see the differences. And then we'll have some comparison uh, we, we have a little bit of a, of a conflict here. We, we called it a no-build case. We said use current travel time. We wanted to have something to compare it to. They, when they run a no-build for 2045, said what would that look like? Uh, but we just wanted to be able to provide something we could say, yeah, I know that that's bad, and this baseline provides this much improvement, and the management network will provide whatever uh, additional possible improvement. And so back to the next step, similar to Commissioner Bridges' slide, uh, we, we intend to bring back some prelim uh, preliminary results uh, at the September meeting. And we'll be working uh, closely with the BDOT you know, staff on this. Uh, in October, uh, we'll be presenting more final results. Uh, you see them in uh, September. They're going to give you some things we need to go back over. We'll come back in October. Those. And then, of course, we've got the uh, HRT Bill Board meeting in November and the HRTAC meeting in December. Uh, my understanding is that uh, they're looking to have that master tolling agreement approved uh, by December of 2019. That would probably be at the HRTAC meeting. Uh, so with that, uh, that concludes uh, my comments. If there's any questions, I'll be happy to try to answer. So, so.
So, Mr. Chairman, of course, the big message we want to leave with you is we would like to suggest that you meet with the TPO. Mr. Page and I have uh, coordinated on this in the HR Task Force on September the 19th. We just see benefit in everybody getting the same information together. Um, BDOT, uh, the commissioner, talked with you about the details they're going to have. We'll have our analysis that we'll be coordinating with them. That is sort of the target thing for you to have the best information possible to make this Well, two things. First of all, do your, you know, go ahead and proceed with your study. Yeah. Let's get this going. Yes, uh, I just don't want to slow this thing down at all. Kevin, we're not going to have time. i got to get this thing moving. Uh, sir, I mean, I didn't start to cut you off. Do you have a comment? Just a quick comment. Um, one of the, I know we're running over, so we can't really get into this today, but uh, I do see a problem with access from 664 from Newport News getting to the hot lanes, and if we can fine tune that, I have no problem moving we'll back to Mercury, but that is a concern. Okay, great, thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Just very quickly, I am somewhat concerned that we may have two competing uh, analysis, yeah. and it's very problematic for decision makers to have two concurrent analysis being conducted with maybe different research questions. <coughs> yes, maybe a different methodology, maybe different methods of data collection, and certainly different philosophical assumptions. And therefore, you may get different findings. Well, my, my, understanding, my understanding is that they've coordinated with DDOT a little bit on this already, right? So you guys are okay with this. Sir, let me just rephrase it. All right. um, when you have different philosophical assumptions going into research, TPO, there's one assumption as it relates to uh, how what you believe sir, as you approach. You're told, you're not told. What's the network? How do you find the network? VDOT has a different philosophical assumption already. There, there are limitations and limitations. Methodology is your, is your assumptions plus the methods that you're going to use to collect the data. It's going to have different findings. Very problematic. All kind of so, what are you recommending? Um, I, think I mean, I, I understand assumptions. That your, whatever study you come with is based on assumptions. Yes, sir. I mean, I fully understand that. I'll raise a research every time to do that to you. I think that we, it's clear, clearly there are different philosophical things. We'll, we'll just be aware of that, and when it comes in, and those are the kind of questions we can address. The, 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 the fundamental part, the way I was understanding this, is that VDOT, you're proceeding, you're studying, you're going to come back with the information we've asked for. What you're doing is supplement to that, all right? So if you come back in here, we've got to shoehorn this into that, then we're going to have a problem. So just be sensitive to the fact that you don't come in here and confuse the situation. <laughs> All right. Okay, I would, I would have to agree with Mayor Alexander on you know how we're putting this together because I can see what how what question would I know to ask depending on how each plan is being put together. I may not know the correct answer to ask depending on the plans. So I see where Mayor Alexander is going as far as how do we determine what is the best course of action as far as these plans going forward because each one of them may be presented in a different direction to us. Okay, Johnson. I absolutely concur with Mayor Alexander. And I really think, I'm sorry that we haven't had the time to hear from Mr. Page today, but you know, I guess I'm confused because it looks like we're, we're pulling all these pieces apart and we're trying to piecemeal this and that, and this works and this doesn't work. Um, when in fact, I think we ought to be looking at building the entire ring there from Jefferson to Bowers Hill. And I think we ought to be looking at how we can do that. Um, I know we haven't had the discussion of tolls, but as the toll revenues come in, I'm not sure that that couldn't pay for that. And then once that was done, maybe those tolls could go away. You know, but I think the idea is that instead of arguing whether it's Mercury or LaSalle or whatever, we should be looking at the whole piece, as, as, and that's how I see it with HDAC. 
So that that's just my two cents of it. Um, I just don't understand why we're having, you know, do we want it at Mercury or LaSalle or this or that. We want the whole system to work for the, for the region. That's what we want. Okay, well, let's take a minute here and pause and reflect to burn some, we'll burn some time, we'll do it to get this thing straight. Because I think what's important, I think what's important here, and Donnie's been talking about this for quite a while, is the concern, because where this thing started, down near Mallory Street, was just not going to work. Anybody that has to live in that section understands it's not going to work. So we thought about, and, and, and DDOT has come in and talked about this one piece, because my understanding of watching is that the whole the whole network is being looked at? That's the whole purpose of your study. Okay, so we're not looking at it in these fields, but there's a part here that we need to we need to fine tune, and this is that the important part. We're spending 3.65 billion dollars into that tunnel, and we got to get in there without causing a, a big bottleneck. You know this, I know this, you know it. Everybody that lives down here. Anybody works on it? And I did when I said the South Side didn't care. You care because you got to come over here. Okay? <laughs> so here's the part. It's all being studied. Okay? That part's being studied. This is a fine-tuned part that I'm glad we at least addressed. The Donnie talked about this as uh, numerous times. We got it back to LaSalle. And I agree that that's, if you get anywhere around 664, anywhere near that 664 section down there, near the Hampton College, it's going to create a mess. That is a, right now, that is a real sore spot in our area. And he raised the point of also the issue that, well, we we didn't want to have anything up in that section. Well, that's not true, because we had no, we, we didn't, but we didn't have a reason to look at it. So for VDOT and their study, they're looking at the whole thing, and they're going to take that part of it. Now, this, this is, I think it's important for VDOT to take a look at that. You want to know where we want to go, right? And you've also suggested we go back further up if we have to. That's what started it. We went back a little further. Now we're back to the same. You can go back even further if you need to. Right? right. So that's, that's a, that, I think that's an important part of this whole process so we can move forward when we're done. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Chair Shepard, Nick Downey here, Deputy Secretary of Transportation. I just wanted to note one thing on the HR TPO versus the VDOT study, I think there is one kind of key difference is the commissioner has really been focused on when this work is complete in 2025, how does this system work? And that's why he's been using the micro simulation, looking at the weaving and a lot of these other issues, which Mayor Tuck highlighted some of the problems we saw at Mallory Street and Zeppler's Landing. I think with the TPO staff were proposing to do was to look out, okay, after 20 years of operations, which one of these might give us a, a different kind of, what are the results in that circumstance? So our understanding was that we were, we're not looking at potentially competing information because we're looking at two decades apart trying to understand, okay, what's best in 2025 and is that similarly the best outcome in 2045 to give you all as the decision makers in this region as we work with you in the coming months, both an understanding of what happens when the new capacity first arrives, but then also after there's been some growth in the region, uh, which of those circumstances can best help this region continue to move the most people through the 64 corridor as you grow. I'm glad you clarified that because I, I was the only assumption that we understood that. Obviously not. You're right. We, having two competing at the current time would not be good because they would stay a lot of confusion. But these are, these are I, I looked at this as being a supplemental part, correct? It was a different plan, right? Okay. And so the assumptions can be different. In fact, they should be. So, Yes, sir. I just wanted to get one other thing because this has been a topic of discussion among your uh, chief administrative officers committee for a couple of, for several months. And we also believe that adding the data and being supplemental is not anything that disagrees with what our design is deep Having information about baseline figures, of, about general purpose lanes, if the lanes were added as general purpose lanes as opposed to hot lanes what difference that would make in capacities and so on and so forth is a very important decision uh, information to have, whether it's at 2025 or how that impact and how that would impact in 2045 as well. So I can tell you on behalf of the Chief Administrative Officer, we don't care who does it, but we think having that additional information is critically valuable. Okay. Thank you. Any other discussion points? Okay. Procedures, Daddy. Procedures.
study. <laughs> okay. Uh, public comment period. Uh, no one signed up for that. Uh, there is a submitted public comment. Uh, excuse me. To transcribe. Okay. Uh, we have uh, the nominating committee. Uh, uh, I'm going to add uh, Mayor West. Okay. And uh, sorry. Um, okay, uh, item 21, this is a uh, the regional connection study phase two supplemental budget emission that we heard earlier. So moved. Okay. You've got a motion. Then move. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, opposed? If I made a second was Mr. Green for the post. Got it. Okay. And then item 22, the additional transportation alternative to set aside funding for Hampton Roads project to my temple. Uh, you want to well, just very quickly, included in your agenda, uh, some monies were set aside and we didn't want to swept away to do some federal action. This is an opportunity to put those monies on some of the projects. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there's detail in your agenda. Um, we would ask for a specific action uh, approving that allocation as projects. So the motion has been made. Second? Second. All in favor say aye. Uh, opposed? Okay. I just want to comment on that real quick. If you haven't looked at that list, all right, there, there's a list down in this in the in this thing, and it lists all the money that's been spread out all over all over Hampton Roads. And everybody's got some of it. This was a great way of not losing the money. Okay, because the state is going to pull that money back. That's a great plan. So I'm glad you passed it. All right, uh, now item 23, the approval of consent items. Okay, got a move of that motion. Okay, green, motion, second. Give me a second. Thank you, you already got a second. Mr. Harrell, okay. All right, got it. So, Mr. Harrell, uh, motion, Mr. Harrell, Mr. Green, second. There we go. All in favor of the consent agenda, approving the consent items, say aye. Aye. Uh, there you go. No opposed? Okay. We have the three month uh, three month tenant schedules listed. Correspondence of interest is in there. Minutes from the advisory committee, a the TPO advisory committee, items for your information, old business, and there's nothing else. Okay, so we'll adjourn. So um, if I can note, I've 